So I think that um, a lot of the time, uh, students learn about the scientific method a lot in their science classes and natural science classes, but not so much in social sciences. So um, I think that difference and differences is a really simple way to take the same idea of how si the scientific method applies generally and apply it to more of a social studies question. So overall, the question is, we teach our students that correlation and causation are not the same thing, because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean that one causes the other. For instance, you know, birds fly south, don't make winter happen. And uh, oh, this is a really big deal, right? In the 1700s, there were tons of pirates and not so much global warming. And today, we don't have pirates so much anymore, except in Somalia. But, uh, but, but we have this global warming problem. So, so I, I, someone could argue that the lack of pirates was directly linked to, to our global warming problem. Um, I, I wouldn't make that argument myself. But, 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 it, but it, this makes clear that correlation and causation are not the same thing. But sometimes it's not so obvious. For instance, you guys are probably passionate about this question, class size and student learning. So if we decreased your, the, the size of your classes by one student, how much would test scores increase? How, <laughs> I, I know the answer, do you want to hear it? Um, the answer is it increases a very, very, very tiny bit. One fifteenth of a standard deviation, which is not very much. <laughs> so, so then the question is, well, this, this one fifteenth of a standard deviation answer, how can we ever know something like this? And natural sciences are a great model here. So, so, so we can look at what they do. They've been doing this for a lot longer than the social sciences have, and, and try to learn from them to figure out, well, how do you ever infer true causation? For instance, they're answering questions like, so if you expose a cell to this certain element, it's a little more oxygen, a little less oxygen, some arsenic, you name it, how does it affect its growth rate? Or, uh, or, or we use treatment language here a lot. So, so if you expose a, a cancer patient to a certain treatment, how do you know what effect that treatment is gonna have on his health outcome? Um, and, and the idea here is you do what we call a randomized control experiment. So you separate all your um, potential subjects into two groups, you do this randomly. And you expose one group to a treatment and the other one you don't expose them to the treatment and you compare how they were different before to how they were different after. Right? So this is why we call it difference in differences. We look at their differences before, we look at their differences after, and we look at how those differences are changing. Um, now, now th there's gotta be two things going on here, right? One is randomized. We've gotta think that whatever treatment we're assigning is, um, is random and it's gotta be controlled and what that means is the one group is getting the treatment, the other group is not. Now what I'm presenting here is, is not gonna be a perfect randomized control experiment, but it's kinda showing you how we kinda try to do the same thing. Um, and it's, it's not gonna be so simple though in social sciences, because if we do things you know, to molecule cells or even people who, um, who, who need some medical treatment, there's typically not that many ethical questions, right? Um, however, if you're doing this with an entire economy, people are gonna get upset. So, so if I were gonna ask a question like, suppose, what is the, what is the effect of, of, of a recession on schooling? So let's, let's pick a state, say Wyoming, let's cause a recession in Wyoming and see what happens, right? No one's gonna be too keen on that one. Um, or, or, or there's a whole bunch of um, social science questions like, what is the effect of having a female teacher on um, female students as opposed to male students, right? So you could randomly assign teachers to students. There it's not as big a deal, right? But if you're looking at something like uh, unemployment, like let's fire a whole bunch of fathers to see what the effect of paternal unemployment is on children's learning outcomes, right? That, that's that's, that's kind of not so clear, right? So if you want to see, well, what is the effect of a recession on a local population? Right? Suppose half of the people who live in your town lose their jobs. What's that going to do to the size of the town? Was, is, are people going to move away? Uh, Etc. right? So this kind of question. Um, the thing is, it happens all the time. The way it happens all the time is government policies affect different states in different ways. For, for instance, um, do you guys know what the dropout age, uh, the, the, the compulsory schooling age in Colorado is? 17. 17. Has it always been 17? No. no, it used to be 16, right? So here's a change that we can use, right? No one's choosing to stay in school differently. Right? The law is forcing you to do it, so it's kind of, you know, compare people in one state to another depending on what the compulsory schooling ages are. Um, so, so government policy happens. Sometimes reality treats different states in different ways. And, and um, um, I'll tell you a story of this in, in a little bit. Um, but whenever this happens, we call it a natural experiment. Right? We have reality somehow randomly assignment, assigning a treatment to one group and not to another. 
So here's my story, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try to sell it to you in the next few minutes. Uh, so, so, so silver was a big deal in Colorado uh, in the 1890s. So, so there, there was a policy that the federal government, they, in 1890, they started buying up silver in huge amounts. They were buying up silver like crazy. The price of silver skyrocketed. It went up as high as $1.50 an ounce. And this is $1890, so that's a lot more in today's dollars. Um, then in 1893, this, this uh, Sherman Silver Purchase Act got repealed, and the price of silver fell dramatically. Um, Colorado was a big silver producer, so this, this decrease affected Colorado a lot more than it did your average state, since Colorado was producing 60% of the nation's total silver. However, not all counties were producing silver. Some counties, really, really big silver producers, right? Leadville, what's the county Leadville is in? Well, they were a big silver producer. Other counties, not so much. Right? So, so you get some counties producing a whole lot of silver, other counties not. So then the question is, so what is this huge fall in the price of silver going to do in a town that does nothing but produce silver? It's going to cause a huge local increase in employment, a huge local recession. Well, what if there's another county where they don't produce silver at all? Well, there the effect is not going to be as big. Right? So I'm, I'm going to argue to you that you can treat this silver crash of 1893 as kind of a randomly assigned treatment. It's going to affect some counties a lot. It's going to affect some counties just a little. So if we compare the outcomes of these two different counties, we can kind of see, you know, get a test of, well, how does this local recession affect local outcomes? So I, I came up with these two questions, right? You could, you could work with your students. You could come up with a whole bunch more. But the first one I thought about, well, well, you know, this is a period where a whole lot of people are moving west. So how is the population in a county going to be affected when there's a huge local recession? Right? Migration rates here are really, really high. It could be the case that, uh, you know, everyone leaves and the town disappears. Or it could be the case that the, count, that the town continues growing. It just continues growing at a much slower rate. Right? In addition, the male-female ratio could be affected. As, um, you know, in 1890s, Colorado was a very male state. Um, so so in, in a town that gets a huge local recession, there's no more silver mining, it could be the case that um, the migration of men is affected differently from the migration of women. So the percentage of the town that's male could, could, could change here. Right? So, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at two counties, one county being a big silver producer. Right? This is going to be my treatment county. They're the one receiving this huge shock. Uh, the other county is a count, county that isn't. Uh, so I call this the control town. And, and, I'm gonna, and the idea is, well, these two counties could have been basically the same beforehand. One of them gets a huge shock. One of them doesn't. And uh, we can compare the two before and after and see what happens. Now, again, I'm, I'm going to assume here a couple things. One thing that I'm assuming is that this treatment, this silver crash, is randomly assigned. right? So that uh, it's like we were tossing a coin and we're going to say, well, something is going to crash in price. What's it going to be? And it turned out, oop, something crashed. And it was silver. Um, uh, the next thing I'm assuming is that these two towns, these two counties, would have been exactly the same had this not happened. Right? Now, now this, that, that this is where this gets complicated, right? In a natural experiment, you can actually perfectly control this. You can take the lab rats and you can keep them in their cages and you know that they would have been exactly the same. Real life is not so simple. Okay, so here's where I get my data. Can you guys see what it says on that? Uh, it's 12 census. This is when I actually went, uh, it was just, you know, across campus at the Auraria Library. They've got all these old census books for every census. Um, I guess the more recent censuses are, you know, digitally available. They don't actually print these anymore. But, uh, but this is really neat. So, so there's this one table where it has both the male and the female population of every county in Colorado for 1900, 1890, and 1880. Um, and then I picked two counties. I picked uh, Douglas County and Eureka County. Now, 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 this is where, if I had you know, more time, I would have talked to a historian of Colorado who would actually tell me more about this, because I'm kind of new to the state still, and, and I don't really know, you know the histories of all the counties and how they're different and how they're the same. But, but from what I looked up, Eureka County had lots of mining, lots of silver. Douglas County, they started doing some mining, but then they figured out that there wasn't that much. So they started mining rhyolite instead. Does anyone know what rhyolite is? It's a rock. 
and it's a really pr <laughs> it's, it's a really pretty rock, and it's a rock that they use to put on the sides of buildings, so the buildings look really nice. So if, if you go to the McDonald's on Colfax, that looks that they just redid, and it's really nice, and it's got those rocks on the outside, that's kind of what Rylite is. Um, so so the, the price of Rylite is not so highly correlated to the price of silver. Um, so silver crashes. Oh no, oh no. People in your, your county, really, really upset. Local recession, really, really bad. People in Douglas County, hey, things are not so good, right? They were used to be selling a lot of rhyolite, but they can still mine and sell rhyolite, just not as much as before. So here's the way, it's, it's a little bit math, right? I'm gonna give you a little, little arithmetic here. So, so we're separating through the group, separating um, the two counties, right? One is the treatment, one is the control. We're looking at each before and after, right? So, so we get to observe them, each of them two times, so we get a total of four measurements. One of each before, one of each after. So A minus B is, all right, so the treatment group, this is how they are after the treatment. This is how they are before, so this is how much they changed. All right, this is the difference um, in the treatment group. You get to observe the control group after and before, and then you see the difference in the control group. Right? The whole assumption of the experiment is that if there had been no treatment, these two would be the same. Right? This is the big, big underlying assumption that you have to be convinced of if you're ever gonna believe that the relationship is causal. Right? Had there been no treatment, A minus B and C minus D would be identical, which means that this difference in differences would be equal to zero. Right? But because of the treatment, something caused this group to behave differently than this group, which means that that's what is gonna be our estimate of the causal relationship. Okay. Um, this is where I would pause for questions, but we're moving on. Okay, so, <laughs> so we get to see the population, right, in Ure County in 1900, and the population in Ure County in 1890. So in that 10 year period, the population in that county de decreased by 1,700 people, right? In Douglas County, however, the population in 1900 was 3120, before it was 3006, so 114, right? Douglas County is a lot more populated now than it was back then. <laughs> so is Deere County, but Douglas even more so, right? Um, so the difference between these two counties in 1900 was 1611. The difference between the two counties in 1890 was 3504, right? So, 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 I, so you'll see that Deere County in this period decreases in population while Douglas County increases, right? So if you look at the difference in differences estimator, it's about 1893, right? So, so one way you can say this is um, the population in Eureka County decreased by 1893 in part due to the shock caused by this local recession. Now, if you had a really, really bright student, they would say, hey, hey, this isn't fair, right? Because the, you want to look at percentage changes here. You probably don't want to look at the number of population because initially they started at different levels. I would say, that's a really smart student. Let's look at that instead. So, so, so Ure County sees a 27% decrease in population. Douglas County sees a 4% increase, right? So the assumption here is, had there been no shock due to the decrease in the price of silver, these two would have been on similar trends. So Ure County would have seen a 4% increase in population. Because of the price shock, you see these, they go on different paths, right? One, is treat, one gets the treatment, so it gets a different uh, difference and that you actually see a 31% change. Right. Now, is this really true? No, it probably isn't, right? This is, but we'll get to that in a minute, right? <laughs> let's, let's look at percent male. So if you look at Ure County in 1890, it was 77.1% male. In 1900, it's 63.7% male, right? So that's a 13.4% decrease in the percentage of the population that's male, right? So this means when the price of silver crashes, a lot of men seem to leave. Um, in Douglas County, it goes from 61.7, still very male, to 56.2, but that difference is 5.5. So the differences in the differences is 8.9, right? So this, what you could say here is, when you see this local unemployment, right, that there's outmigration from Ure County, and this outmigration in Ure County is disproportionately male. So it's becoming much more even in male-female terms, right? Now, Underline, there's, there's these assumptions that I'm making, right? Basically, the key assumption is, I'm assuming that these two are on identical paths, that if it were not for the silver crash, that the patterns between the two counties would have been identical, 
right? Now, this is, um, this is where you can involve your students and think about it, right? In what ways are these two counties different in 1890? Right? Would these two counties, ha would they have been the same? Would they have been on the same path or not? Well, can we look at these two communities that, that makes this the same or makes this different, right? Now, and it could also be the same that the kind of people who lived in Uray are different than the kind of people who lived in Douglas. And maybe the kind of people who live in Uray County, they're the kind of people who, who cares what happens here, we're gonna stay here. But the people who live in Douglas are more like, you know, more likely to move, right? So there's all these assumptions that you have to make about not only um, the patterns of, the, of the, the way the places are, but the kind of people who live there, right? And, and in this case, these assumptions are probably not right, right? These two places are probably very different in lots of ways that I'm not accounting for, that uh, would have put them on different trends if it weren't, even if it weren't for the silver crash, right? But, but just thinking about this idea might, might give students a sense of the way the scientific method works in the social sciences. Um, and, and yes, it could be the case that there is a pattern, but the, that I just picked these two outlying towns because they gave me the story that I wanted to tell you, <laughs> right? This is why you need sample size to be bigger, right? Um, still, it's getting students to think critically about the research question. So um, my point here is we can use difference and differences in the social sciences to replicate the scientific method that students are more used to seeing in the natural sciences. So they can still infer causality about things like, you know, the relationship between recessions and population growth, uh, the recessions between, you know, class size and student learning. Um, that's, you would still use difference and differences to answer that question, right? There we just randomly assign different teachers to different class sizes and look at, you know, test scores over time. Um, and then using something like this with a simple difference and differences question, students would collect the data, organize them, do a little difference and differences table to try to estimate um, an outcome. And uh, then they could, you know, use some uh, critical thinking skills to say how convincing is my, the argument that I'm making based on this difference and differences. All right. Thank you very much.